I uh, privilege to introduce a friend of mine, John Todd, uh, and he's going to be talking about future proofing ISP DNS recursive resolver. Hello, John. Can we hear you through the magic of technology? I hope so. Awesome. Great. Great. Thank you for having me, and uh, welcome back from lunch, everyone. I'm sorry that I could not be there in person. I wish that uh, I was sitting there uh, with a coffee myself. Um, so, my name is John Todd. I'm the general manager for Quad9, uh, which is a recursive resolver uh, operator based in Switzerland. I, at the moment, however, am based in North America. So, my apologies to the frogs in the background. It's quite early in the morning here, and they may be making themselves known outside my window. Um, so, uh, what I want to do today is talk a little bit about uh, sort of the concept of future proofing uh, ISP DNS recursive resolvers. Those are things that um, uh, most uh, ISP or network providers offer in some fashion. And um, I'm going to take my Quad9 hat off partially because um, I want to talk to you about what, not what Quad9 does on the recursive side, meaning in our, our global uh, uh, configuration, but really what we get questions about from um, small, medium, and even actually some large ISPs about how to integrate with our system, but also how to just how to create a robust DNS architecture uh, in general. So uh, you'll hear me talk about a little bit about technology, but also about some other kind of policy level things here that for uh, ISP recursive resolvers need to be thought about um, for both today and now in the, in the coming future. Um, so the first thing is that um, uh, DNS is one of those fundamental components of a network that is um, always or never to blame, depending on how you are uh, looking at it from, or from where in the network you're looking at it. Um, so it's really important to do DNS correctly uh, and get it done robustly. Um, DNS, um, most of the time, um, has been something that's kind of a second thought for network providers, but it's becoming something that you have to think about quite a bit more um, as it's becoming more complicated here in the last four or five years, really. So what are the features as a network service provider that you should offer? And we say we should, you should offer these because we see, of course, a strong demand for this from Quad 9's perspective, but it's things that people are more talking about these days. What are the best common practices and the standards that are becoming uh, kind of table stakes for operating a recursive resolver inside of your network? So um, the Quad 9, of course, focuses on um, both security and privacy. So we'll talk about privacy in a couple different ways. Um, high privacy externally means don't leak your private data, don't leak PII outside of your network. And so that's um, meaning uh, queries associated with IP addresses, you probably don't want to have distributed outside of your network. Um, that's becoming much more uh, concerning data. Um, no one has really treated um, DNS queries themselves as PII, but certainly IP addresses associated with, PI, uh, with queries are. So, um, in, especially in Europe and North America, that's becoming more critical, but that's going to spread internationally as well. Um, and then high privacy internally, um, what's your privacy policy as far as what you do, what you say you do with your DNS data? And I'll talk a little bit more about that later in the deck. Um, then from a technical perspective, what, are, what you should offer, and of course, fast response, you want to have quick uh, responses on DNS, so cached answers are something that you're really looking to give as much as you can. Encryption um, has been around now for quite some time. Uh, we were one of the first resolvers to operate with DOT or DNS over TLS back in 2017. Uh, that's now becoming very standard as well as DNS over HTTPS. Uh, emerging standards of DNS over QUIC is, are, is coming soon, um, and we're seeing rapid adoption of that by client software manufacturers, browser manufacturers, operating system manufacturers. So the transition to encryption is happening, and uh, as, a, as a resolver operator, you probably should be offering that or um, you'll be left behind. DNSSEC strict out validation. Um, DNSSEC to validate and make sure that the answers you're getting from uh, authoritative servers out on the internet are in fact true. Um, DNSSEC uh, historically has had a lot of um, uh, uh, detractors because it's problematic or has been problematic, but that really hasn't been the case in the last few years. Uh, Quad9 has been operating strictly validating DNS second infrastructure since we started in 2017. We very rarely get complaints now, and we have tens of millions of users um, in uh, every nation in the world almost at this point. DNS second is no longer something that you should not And 
Lastly, and actually most importantly, is value-added services. Um, are you using the DNS for anything else? Are, do your end users find value in what you're doing with the DNS? Do you offer some kind of malware, anti-phishing service? Do you block ads? Is there something else that you're doing with the DNS that makes people want to use your service versus trying to go over the top uh, and use some outside service like uh, something like Quad9 or any of the other advertising free services that block ads, for example. So let's go through what DNS has looked like traditionally, and then we'll talk about what we see or as a potential suggestion for ISPs is a better way to do it. So do it yourself, right? Run a resolver inside your network. Your resolvers talk to the, or sorry, your users talk to the resolver. There's a cache in it, and then the resolver talks out to the internet. Um, this is kind of the, the DIY version that's been done for a very long time. Um, most uh, operators are familiar with this model. It keeps your traffic local, meaning that your resolver is inside your network. Your cache answers are very close to your end users. Um, it allows you to have some flexibility and add some additional features into your resolver if you've got the skills to do it. Um, the cons are there that it's no longer as trivial as it used to be if you're doing encryption. Um, uh, there, are, uh, there are some costs to the software to manage and maintain. Um, and uh, the value add, you then have to figure out how you're going to do that value add. What is it you're going to provide and how much is that going to cost you um, if you're going to do those yourself. And then, of course, somebody needs to own the services in your technical team. There's another model of doing recursive DNS where you essentially outsource your DNS directly, where you send your customers or your end users directly to a global recursive resolver. Um, in this instance, I'm going to use 9.9.9.9 because I'm quad 9, but you can substitute any other global resolver in there. Um, this avoids any of the costs or hassles of running your own infrastructure, but you lose uh, pretty much all of the control. Um, it's extremely easy and it's extremely cheap. You don't have to have any hardware, um, but um, you you don't have any control and you don't have any ability to offer any value add other than what gets sent out to that global resolver. If you're going to use, if you're going to pay that global resolver operator. If they, as an example, if they try to sell you some upgraded package of some sort, like anti-malware, um, you can do it that way. It's slower um, because you're automatically sending your traffic off net. There are no locally cached responses, so it's not as particularly fast as it could be. Um, and then there's DNS forwarding is another model um, where you have a forwarder, which is really something like Bind or Power DNS or any of the other operations uh, of software, um, and you forward the queries out to a global resolver. That's easy-ish. You still have to implement the software. You still have to have a server there that, to do that. Um, it's not particularly robust. You're actually introducing more points of failure. So if the global resolver fails, you've got an issue. If your equipment fails, you have an issue. Um, and it's uh, typically not dynamically re reconfigurable unless you have a cluster of them in some kind of any cast mode. Um, so um, I'd like to introduce maybe a new model of doing it um, that many of you might consider, and that is using DNS disk as a robust hybrid approach. So this is the model that we, uh, that I, we suggest or that could be suggested as a way to do this. Your users are going to go talk to a software package called DNS Dist. DNS Dist is really a shim. It is not a recursive resolver, meaning it doesn't actually answer queries, but it has a cache. It has a development language for uh, doing policy and a bunch of other things. And then you would also have a local resolver inside your network with a low priority. So, and then you would send all of your queries out to a global resolver at a high priority. So this would allow you to still get the benefits of the large global resolver for most of your queries and to cache them inside your network. But yet, if you have a problem with the network or there's a problem with the global resolver or there's a problem somewhere in the stack outside of your control, you can still fail over to the local resolver uh, inside your network. Um, so this model allows you to have both the benefits of the local resolver, but also have um, the ability to do the outsourcing to the global resolver for some of those value adds. It also increases the speed because typically the global resolver is going to be faster than you are in some of these responses because they have a larger cache community. Um, so uh, uh, there's also an interesting ability for you to add a lot more flexibility and interesting tools inside of DNS disk. I'm sorry if I'm sounding like a DNS to salesperson here. It's an open source package. We use it inside Quad9. It's amazingly flexible. Uh, it is extremely robust. Um, we have very 
almost never, I shouldn't say never, but almost never have crashes. And we serve you know, tens, billions, hundreds of billions of queries on this platform without any difficulty. However, it still requires to have hardware in sight or on site. It still does require someone on your staff to understand it. So it doesn't avoid the complexity of owning the service yourself, but it gives you a lot of upsides. Um, so DNS just is sort of a universal toolkit for advanced DNS. Um, anybody who's doing anything sophisticated with DNS services should really look at and understand DNS disk. It sits in front of uh, a recursive resolver like un Bind, Unbound, uh, but also inside of, uh, in front of uh, other providers like Quad9, Google, Cloudflare, or others. Um, so you can stack these benefits. Um, so DNS disk will do encryption, so it will support DOH and DOT. Uh, it will actually forward out on, with encryption. Uh, it has a packet cache, so it's, it's super fast. Um, and it supports some other interesting features. I can't go into all of them here, but you should really take a look at DNS disk and see what it can do for you in this hybrid model where there's a local resolver in your network, but you're sending your queries out to a global resolver. Um, it gets you that robustness and that ability to add features very quickly. Um, so, forwarding your queries out to global provider, why would you do that? Um, like, in other words, why would you have not just incorporate all of this inside your own network? There's actually some pretty good reasons for that. Um, the, the DNS right now is getting more complicated with encryption, um, with some of the new standards coming out for privacy, et cetera. Um, why not have somebody else do that for you if you can, uh, if you can rather? So, um, outsourcing some of that work to a global resolver does actually sometimes make sense. Um, it's high reliability. Uh, we operate um, with a, a lot of nines, obviously, quad nine, but we operate with a lot of nines for reliability. Um, the only time that that's a problem typically is when there's a network issue between the provider and the, the outsourced uh, global resolver. That's why you have that failover backup inside your own network that you can kick back to automatically with DNS disk. Um, but other reasons to use an outsourced or, or to use the global resolver are larger communities mean faster caches, meaning that those answers are probably already in the cache. Um, also, larger communities uh, means a bigger crowd, and that needs more privacy. No one can identify where queries are coming from because there's a larger uh, set of noise to, uh, in, into which your queries are going to be inserted. And those global resolver operators are probably spending a lot of time focused on DNS, whereas maybe this is not the primary job of your team. Um, so they'll be able to catch problems and solve problems before maybe you even see them. Lastly, and most importantly, um, some of these larger operators provide value-added services like the anti-malware, anti-phishing security service, which Quad9 does as an example. And if you can get that for free, why wouldn't you use that for, as a primary uh, resource? In other words, send all your queries through someone like Quad9, where you can get that added benefit at no cost. So how do you pick the global recursive resolver? Um, well, of course, we're biased towards Quad9 um, because we're a nonprofit. We don't, we don't get any money from any of this. Our job and our mission is to provide security and privacy. But um, there are others out there. There are some that provide different services than we do. Um, you probably want to look closely at the privacy policy um, and see you know, what is being done with that data. How is it being uh, applied? Um, but also, uh, you want to look at some of the technical components of it as well. Latency, um, like how far is it between your DNS disk instance, uh, which is going to be doing that packet cache, and the global recursive resolver? What's the latency? The speed is important, but it's not as critical as many uh, make it out to be. 10 milliseconds is probably going to be okay. Um, in fact, even more than that is usually not noticeable by end users. Uh, you want to do that test yourself, but um, though there's a lot of people who are making you know, one or two milliseconds into a big deal. It really isn't. Uh, with DNS because DNS queries are typically done in parallel, so it's not like you're stacking that delay. Um, where is the resolver cluster? Is it nearby? Is it in the same country as you are? Or are you sending your queries across the borders? If you are sending queries across national borders, do they support encryption? Um, if they do support encryption, how does that work? Test it out. Um, and what's the value add? What are the things they're trying to add to the service? Is it something like ad blocking? Is it malware blocking, uh, et cetera? And then is the global resolver operator aligned with your interests? Um, these are questions that you can answer just by doing some quick research. Quad9 doesn't want your queries. The whole reason for me giving this talk is that I would love to see every ISP in the world using a forwarder and a, a failover backup in this, in this model. Um, lots of ISPs do send those queries directly from their end users. Um, we would love to not see the IP addresses of your end users. We would love to see just a single IP address of your forwarding 
uh, whether that's DNS disk or it's a forwarder, um, because that improves the customer experience for your end users. Uh, it improves privacy. Uh, it removes that toxic component of personal data, meaning the IP address. It doesn't expose that to the rest of the network. Um, so, uh, and then lastly, of course, it reduces the load. Um, we would love to see caching being pushed closer to the edge of the network as far as we can, um, but still being able to give people that benefit of the security, uh, meaning the anti-malware, anti-phishing, um, and also the privacy. Um, so uh, other things that are kind of table stakes now for um, DNS is adaptive DNS discovery. This is an interesting one that once you've got something like DNS disk in your network, where your users are pointing at DNS disk, you can enable this relatively quickly. This means how do you automatically turn a user from just a standard UDP unencrypted user into an encrypted DOT or DOH user? Uh, and adaptive DNS discovery is now being adopted by many vendors, uh, mobile devices, Android and iOS are now supporting this and Windows and Mac OS I think are in, in queue right now. Um, Really, it comes down to being able to answer a static response. You can see in, the, in my slide there, DNS, underscore dns.resolver.arpa type 64. The device, the first time the device comes onto the network, it will actually ask for that from the local resolver, and it will try to get an answer back, and you can see what the, this is the configuration language, the Lua configuration language here. Um, is, this is how simple it is in DNS disk just to provide back a specific answer. Clients that get an answer that is valid will try to upgrade to encryption. So here's what this actually looks like from a DNS dig perspective. This is what Quad9 looks like, but you can get an idea of how you would do it on your own network. Um, if you do a query of this type, you're going to get a, a, a what's called an SVCB, or that's type 64. Um, you get back two answers if you ask Quad9, and if we give back our IP addresses, and then we give back also the names of dns.quad9.net. So this would cause the client to automatically try to upgrade to a DOT or DNS over TLS connection. First, um, they would have to um, basically get uh, the correct cert, and the cert has to have both the IP address and the name in it, uh, but then they would automatically upgrade to encryption. Um, encrypted DNS is something that people are asking for now quite, uh, quite a bit, so this would allow you to automatically upgrade devices in your network to uh, encryption um, with your resolver as the destination rather than some resolver off network. Um, so some other bonus features you get with DNS disk is you get a lot of monitoring. Um, once you've enabled DNS disk, there are I think a hundred and some odd uh, monitoring elements you get, which is fascinating information because um, the DNS is so core to everything that we find that being able to vis visibly view DNS trends on DNS disk will illuminate other things in your network that you didn't even know were going on. Um, and I put an example of here of looking at serve fails coming from your local resolvers or from DNS disk. Sometimes will illuminate the fact that you are no longer able to reach via BGP certain destinations and authoritatives um, or slowdowns in your network you'll be able to actually see in the DNS rather than having to look at other protocols. Of course, it doesn't substitute for good monitoring in other areas. But um, uh, when uh, the network is sick, uh, DNS sneezes is the, is the term I use. And you can see some of these failures by looking simply at the DNS data with something like Prometheus uh, and Grafana, which uh, DNS disk makes very easy to implement. So um, general DNS experience notes. Um, and I, I said I'd talk a little bit more about um, privacy policies, and so uh, this is something not at a technical level, but if you're future, future proofing your DNS resolver, you really need to look at privacy because this is becoming a critical issue. Um, do you have a privacy policy for your DNS services in particular? Are they specifically called out either as a separate document or are they spoken about in your general privacy document as far as what you do with DNS queries and how you treat DNS as a separate class of information? Um, you probably should consider this. It's relatively easy to build a document for DNS privacy, and customers will typically feel much more comfortable if they know what you're doing with DNS data and that they know their privacy is not being violated. There's actually an RFC now for it, RFC uh, 8932, which is a great resource to start with. There's actually even a prototype privacy policy at the very end of that RFC, which you can cut and paste and, and edit to your, to your um, satisfaction. Um, also, there are some initiatives like the European Resolver Policy.com, which has um, 
which a number of different um, uh, both global resolvers as well as telcos have put some input into, which kind of give a best common practice for um, DNS uh, privacy and DNS data management. Uh, don't be caught unaware of this. Um, DNS privacy is becoming a question of legislative uh, concern. So having these documents ready now or having it already taken care of will hopefully try to uh, eliminate some of those issues for you if suddenly uh, national policy changes or if you have to work across borders. Um, other experience sharing that I'd like to give you is just kind of uh, give you an idea of some of the things you need to be prepared for. Um, Encrypted traffic is quite a bit heavier than unencrypted UDP. Um, so you may experience up to five to 10 times more processing power or memory than UDP. Um, hopefully that number is gonna come down over time, um, especially with some of the new technologies which leverage uh, better stack and incorporation for different encryption protocols, but it is heavier, uh, quite a bit heavier. So be aware that that's the case, but still DNS as a protocol is relatively lightweight and small. So it's not like you're looking at lots of machines to do this, even for a user community of tens or hundreds of thousands of users. Um, it's it's not, still not massive. It's not like web uh, traffic is. Um, so uh, DNS disk again has rate limiting for clients. Um, we found that people who implement some sort of rate limiting or rate visibility will find interesting and surprising um, abuse patterns inside their network where clients are asking for a thousand queries a second for the same name or um, you know people are running some kind of botnet inside their network that's that's doing abusive behaviors um, you should probably look again at DNS disk it has some very interesting uh, rate limiting and rate management tools in there and you'll find abuse where you didn't know you had it uh, lastly ECF or DNS client subnet is not as as effective as you think it should be. Um, and this basically comes down to, again, picking a global provider that has um, good geolocation that is, that is close to you. If you're picking a geo, uh, so ECS basically means if you're getting DNS answers that are good inside of your own country or inside of your own ISP. Um, so make sure that whoever you look at from a global services per perspective is as close to you as possible. Um, last on my list of interesting things that are about to happen um, is recursive to authoritative encryption. We've, we've sort of solved the problem of client to recursive resolver encryption. We've got two, or actually we've really got three different protocols, DNS over TLS, DNS over HTTPS, and there's also DNS crypt, which is less used, um, but that's unfortunate. It's actually a pretty good protocol, um, but it's, it's the third runner. Um, but that solves the client to the recursive resolver. Really now what's missing is the, um, is the uh, recursive to authoritative. That is happening slowly. There have been some tests already done where um, we're looking at some authoritative servers are running on port 853, which is DNS over TLS. And it's opportunistic where the recursive resolver will talk to the authoritative and try to actually create a cryptic connection. Um, so in tests that look to be about, I think the number was around 7 or 8% of the query data was actually able to be encrypted if that was turned on. Um, so that's very interesting. Um, but that's coming soon when the standards are not quite done for that yet, but I think that that's going to happen relatively quickly. Right now, Power DNS Recursive Resolver is the only one to support that, uh, but I suspect that Unbound, Bind, Not, and others will jump on the bandwagon probably within the next year, but that's a guess. Um, to support that encryption. So this would encrypt the entire transaction of DNS, which is great. For, it's really the last unencrypted protocol that's finally seeing uh, full uh, armor being applied to it uh, across the board. Um, so I'm pretty much coming to the end of my uh, discussion. I'm hopefully opening it up for questions um, as far as um, uh, anything specific to Quad9 or the architecture I've described. Happy to answer them. Also happy to answer questions via email if you've got them. Thank you, John. Uh, we've got some time. If anyone has any questions or comments, please uh, come up to the microphones and uh, give me a reminder of your name and affiliation. Thank you. Hi, John. Can you hear me? I can. Super. Uh, my name is Amrish from the Internet Society. So my first question is, uh, I understood the NSD does some amount of caching. Oh, so how, how does this work with the caching which is already existing on the resolver? Uh, it actually works in conjunction with it. So it, uh, DNS disk uses what's called a packet cache, which is slightly different than a regular cache on a, on a resolver. 
Um, but it performs essentially the same function. Um, it, it is a layer in front of the recursive resolver, so it removes the load from the recursive resolver, whether that's going out to the global resolver or whether it's your local recursive resolver. So those queries never make it to the recursive resolver, which is actually very good um, because you want to try to separate that out as much as you can. Recursive resolution uh, takes a lot more energy than simply uh, cache answering. So it's as if you're taking the cache from the recursive resolver and putting it into a separate process, potentially into a separate machine. Um, and it is actually a little bit faster even than the recursive resolver caches that exist in most recursive uh, platforms. All right, thank you. And uh, maybe a second question. So how do you protect the communication between the so the NSTs and the resolvers? Is there encryption in between those two? Ah, yeah, great question. Uh, actually, yes, there is. Um, DNS disk supports not only encryption terminating from the end users, but DNS disk will actually send requests out to the upstream resolvers, whether that's the resolver in your network or whether it's a global resolver. It can actually support DNS over HTTPS and DNS over TLS on the outbound side as well. So it itself looks like a client, which is great because you can also pipeline your queries over a single socket. Um, instead of creating a bunch of different sockets. So it supports both inbound uh, encryption termination and outbound encryption origination requests to uh, resolvers or upstreams. All right, thank you. Hi, I told you, I'm great now. Um, I, I'm a big fan of Quad9. Um, I use a lot for my personal stuff and uh, the, the, the architecture you've described with the uh, DNS disk in front of a quad nine, I've also got that deployed in a, in a few places um, where it makes sense because the, the load is low, but high, kind of quite important that it's reliable within some management environments that are own. My concern is that with a different hat on, I've got a big ISP customer base and there's still a number of CDNs that are using the source of the DNS or the, the, the IP of the DNS resolver to identify how they map traffic. And I, I'm sitting with this quandary of quad nine's great, but yeah. am I going to break things when I'm dealing with a right. massive customer base? Am I yep. going to break CDN traffic? Yep, that, so there's, there's two interesting answers to that. Uh, the first is that quad nine uh, actually does support ECS, meaning that you can tag outbound queries with the, with the slash 24 or the slash 56 or whatever you want of the originating IP address. And we will respect that, meaning we will take that tag and we will pass it on to the authoritative server. So that's, that's ECS in a nutshell. Basically, it's so somewhat privacy violating, meaning you're passing something about the end user out through the query stream to the authoritative server. So we support that 999.11. Um, actually supports ECS, but you have to intentionally pick that IP address. So that's one path. The second path is that the model I described where you put DNS disk in your platform and you have your own recursive resolver, DNS disk supports some really interesting policy uh, tools that are pretty easy to implement. You could find, uh, as an example, the, the domains that are specifically causing you problems, and you could originate the queries to those authoritative servers from your recursive resolver, meaning the the IP address would be the origination inside of your ASN and it would be an IP address that you own and operate. So there's a couple ways to slice it. All right, great. Ed, did you want to? Awesome. All right, anybody else? Well, John, thank you very much for coming in. Uh, we really you. appreciate having you here at uh, the ADOG and informative presentation. Thank you, everybody. All right, well that brings us up next to 21st Century Data Centers, and my pleasure to introduce Martin. Let's just look at it. Let's put it on. Let's move on. Let's take a minute. 